control Shoveling dirt in every hole Predators to condemn your soul Watching you and watching me We're all connected but separated Misunderstood and so frustrated A million armies of one have invaded Watching you and watching me To make headlines be immortalized Everyone's got an electric guy with the digital spies brother standing by to dethrone each other watching you and watching me paranoid the lens is our weapon desensitized in our lust for attention democratized by a boyer obsessions watching you and watching me slips to perfection don't let them project you as you Everyone's got an electric guy with the digital spies. Let your experience begin 
right now. From high atop the mountains of British Columbia to you listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Radio. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride as we are live on Spaced Out Radio. Good evening and welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. If you're listening in on SpacedOutRadio.com, on Spreaker, and now on Revolution Radio, we welcome you to tonight's show as we broadcast live out of Uncle Jimbo's cabin in the Great White North, live on this Thursday night, early Friday morning, if you're on the East Coast. Here at Spaced Out Radio, we do this thing three hours a night, seven days a week. We want to be your official one-stop shop when it comes to the supernatural, paranormal, normal, conspiratorial, ufological, and so much more. If you're on the Spaced Out Radio side and you like our music, you can check out our guitar god, Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses. Check out a couple of his music videos by clicking on the Bumblefoot banner at spacedoutradio.com. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott. SOR, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, and of course our website is spacedoutradio.com. At this time, we'd like to say hello to everyone listening in on the Revolution Radio chat room on the High Plains Talk Radio Network, along with our fans on Spreaker and on Facebook. UFORIA Chronicles, Chronicles of the Unknown, Forest Moon Paranormal, TCPS, and our flagship chat room, the SOR Space Travelers. Have you signed up for the SOR Space Travelers Club yet? No? Well, it's time. Five bucks a month, that's all it costs. And with that, you get your name entered into monthly prize draws, access to private group interviews, access to a special section on our website, and so much more. We're going to give you a heck of a lot more than just access to our archives. While at spacedoutradio.com, you can read our latest blogs, including mine on how to create an emotional investment from your listeners, and you can check out the SOR Spacewire by our news director, Eric Markham, for your latest in weird news. Tonight's show is brought to you by Rivulet Reiki and Readings, providing healings in person or to distance. Purpleplates.com, helping heal your body, mind, and soul. The New Agora newspaper is the official paper of this show, and the iTunes app, Spirit Story Box, it's the official ghost hunting app of SOR. Remember, if you're a listener of Revolution Radio, it is a donation station financed by you, the awesome listener. Take the time, do it for them, and donate today. Tonight's guest really doesn't need an introduction. You will recognize his familiar, sultry voice from the old days of Coast to Coast AM when he hosted the weekends. Today... Ian Punnett is an accomplished journalist, an accomplished author, and has been featured in many major media outlets. Ian is currently working on his Ph.D. from Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University. Tonight, with Ian, we're going to get into the media. Those pesky journalists who turn their jobs from news into sensationalist infotainment. Where did this idea come from? Why are we all seeing media outlets refusing to tell the story, yet showing Kim and Kanye, the Beebs, Donald Trump, or whoever else is famous down our viewing and listening throats. Sometimes we get sick of it, but the ratings say different. What happened to true stories and reporting facts? Or how about Marshall McLuhan's The Medium is the Message? 
When I went to journalism school, we were taught that a true journalist never becomes part of the story. Now, that was in the mid-90s, but today we see so many journalists becoming the story that it really defeats the purpose of the broadcast. When did journalists become left-wing or right-wing? When did stations start taking political sides? And where does the alternative media fit into all of this? Ian's latest book is acclaimpress.com. You can check it out there. It's called A Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell. True crime novel indeed. We welcome Ian Punnett to Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you so much for doing this. No, thank you. And uh, it's more than I deserve, but I I look forward to trying to live up to that introduction. Well, you know, when you're playing with the big boys the way you did for so long, a small guys here, we have to, uh, you, you know, we have to be able know, to show yeah, our who's respect. The, who's talking about journalism, and then you start off by exaggerating? So <laughs> I don't think I've ever been that good. So, but thank you, I'll take it. Well, as I was saying to you off the air, and I'll tell our listeners, when I worked at my radio station in Vancouver, we would be broadcasting in the studio. And when it was a time to switch up with our fellow anchors, we would actually turn on to Coast to Coast on the weekend and listen to you. And when Art was doing the show, we'd listen to Art doing the show because, let's face it, it was intriguing back then. And, yeah, and it was just a good time to have everybody listening in. So when you can get another radio station tuned into what you're doing, you know you've <laughs> made it. Yeah, well, thank you. I love that, and it's always nice to talk to a colleague, so thank you. Ian, why did you decide to get out of radio? <laughs> well, it, uh, it, it, it's pretty much doctor's orders. I, I developed uh, a debilitating case of uh, tinnitus, or tinnitus, as some people call it, but um, and this is a 24-7 condition that I, I have the kind of ringing in the ear that is termed disruptive in that it gets in the middle of everything. So there's no point in the day when it doesn't, you know, when it ceases, there's nothing I can do to make it stop. Um, I, I, everything I do, all the therapies around it are conditional. So there are things that I can um, affect in my environment that can lessen the impact of the tinnitus um, but one of those things I had to stop doing was just wearing headphones all the time, being up crazy hours, um, and um, having a lifestyle that kind of forced this constant audio input um, and didn't allow me to do the kind of therapies that uh, you're supposed to do in order to train your brain away from hearing the tinnitus. So it's the loudest noise I hear right now um, in this little room where I'm sitting here talking to you. Did you always want to be on radio? Because for a lot of people, and you'll understand when I'm saying this, a lot of people who get into radio, it's it's a love, it's an addiction, it's something that just, it, it's bred into them. Did you have that as well? I didn't in the sense that, I mean, I did for show business in general, and I did for media, Um but I've always been a practitioner of multimedia, which is I'm teaching multimedia journalism now. Um, so even while I was doing radio, I was also playing with you know television, and I was writing a lot. And and my resume um, is kind of it's distributed heavily into audio, but I also I actually I produced um, I was the associate producer and the assistant director of a of an arts project from about three years ago, which I just heard tonight is confirmed, is going to be shown on uh, PBS's Great Performances coming up at Christmas. So I've always done a lot of TV and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of projects like A Black Knight for Bluegrass Bell, which is a true crime book, not a novel, by the way, a true crime book. So it's all factual, um, which comes out on October first. So. I, I'm not throwing those in as cheap plugs. I'm just saying, though, I, while doing radio, I always did other things, and I just happen to love radio. And I think, you know, sometimes it's always interesting to see what loves you back the most. And radio lo- loved me back the most, more than television, more than more than print. I know the feeling because I swore when I left radio and I signed off my final broadcast at 10:47 p.m. <laughs> on June 4th, 2007. 
I swore I would never get back in front of the microphone. I was done. It was over. And then when I started having my own personal strange encounters and experiences, I had a buddy of mine like, hey, you got to get back into this. And I and I fought it. Right. I fought it. But that, that drive for journalism, that drive to be in front of the microphone, it never, ever leaves you, does it? Well, so let's separate out some terms here, just because if we're talking about it, you know, being a journalist doesn't require you to be in front of a microphone. You could, you could still, uh, you could still communicate journalistically through all sorts of different media. Um, and the fact that you like this type of exchange, this is a very personal, kind of intimate, um, sort of. Um, on, ongoing radio journal as opposed to journalism. And, and I say that in full respect that you know that there's a difference between, say, as you said, you're, you're central to your own story. You're central to your narrative. And your listeners understand your story as being the lens through which they will, they will hear what you're going to talk about or, or the people you're going to interview. And I think that that's what you, 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 while you were having these unique experiences, you needed to be in community with other people who needed to hear about them and you needed to share them. And radio is the, the shortest line between those two points. That, is, that is very true. That is very true. And, you know, when I went to journalism school, it was very much about focused on radio. We had choice, radio or television. Right. There, there was no internet radio at that time. There was no, we didn't focus on print. That was at another university. This was strictly about the radio side for me. So you learned, it's funny because you learn to write in radio style. What can you put in for 30 seconds and make it as picturesque and colorful as possible? You know, so for me to all of a sudden switch over to a different medium where I'm actually writing stories for a newspaper or something along those lines, it would have been difficult for me. Well, and so you're not doing that. No. You know, you, and that's, that's why in that sense, um, radio journalism and journalism in general is a very different thing than media. Media that we see, that we consume, that we're surrounded by, very little of it is actually journalism. And this concept that, that you spoke of earlier about the detached, objective, uh, you know, science, nearly scientific, like observer of fact, that's a very small part of, of journalism. Um, and most journalism isn't practiced under those strenuous, um, uh, kind of almost academic circumstances. That was a movement that started in the 1930s. Journalism had existed long before then. Uh, the roots of journalism, as I'm sure you know, but I will speak as though you don't, um, is, you know, it goes back to the execution sermons that became very popular as the circuit riding preachers, both in, in Europe and then also in the United States, would go between these communities where somebody was going to be executed and they would tell the story of why this person had to be killed. Why was it that this community was, was going to be ending this person's life? And these execution sermons, you know, they, they, they went into great detail. They had to, in a way, because now you were, you were speaking, in effect, you were speaking for the community, and you were trying to contextualize chaos. You were taking some horrible event, and you were explaining how this execution was going to, uh, it was going to bring a kind of peace to chaos. And this is what people wanted to hear. They would show up in you know, massive numbers to hear these execution sermons just before the person was executed. And it allowed the community to feel like, oh, we get it, we understand. And they became so popular that pastors started to write them down, and then they started to sell them. And then other publications came along that said, well, we don't need a pastor to do it, we'll just do it ourselves. So some of the earliest journalism was just always kind of based on this idea of, of trying to understand our world and even more specifically trying to, um, trying to understand crime and trying to understand how our communities are impacted by it. And it, it, it's a, several hundred years before we get into this social science 
of journalism as something which is almost performed like a doctor standing at the foot of the bed of a patient who's looking down and making observations without becoming the story, as you, as you mentioned earlier. It, the doctor is there to say, well, the, the patient shows this you know, particular wound on the right side of the body. It's causing a fever. In order to effect a change, we have to do this or that. And that's what journalism, you know, in that movement, that academic movement of journalism, it, it changed from what were you know, newsmen they were newsmen. They weren't journalists. They didn't even like a lot of the journalists. They didn't even like to be called journalists. That was a hoity-toity term that they weren't. They didn't, it took a while before journalism kind of got traction in that way, and the journalism schools, um, you know, changed the way we thought about how information was going to be communicated. A long answer, but I, I hope that's in, informative. I thought it was fantastic. We're talking with Ian Punnett tonight on Spaced Out Radio. His latest book can be found at acclaimpress.com, A Black Night for the Bluegrass Bell, true crime book. If you're into it, get it today. Ian, as you decided to focus in on journalism, what do you like or dislike about what is happening with reporters today? Okay. Yeah, and so let me discover there. So, like, my main interest when I went back to to get my PhD was very specifically on that line between what is good crime reporting and what is true crime. You know, true crime as a genre has been around for a long time. It's extremely popular right now. If you think about making the murderer, a uh, Netflix serial, the radio podcast. Um, you know, any of the jinx on HBO, um, all sorts of new series that are coming up that are replicating the success of those programs, too. And so I, it, where is that line? When does something become true crime? And when is it just good crime reporting? And there really isn't a theory of true crime, as we call it. And that's, that's what my dissertation is about. Um, and so that, when you think about the great true crime books... In Cold Blood, Helter Skelter, any number, any number of the books of Anne Rule, you know, the, there's a distinct style and a, and a method to true crime, and that's what I was interested in. Along the way, I had to d- get a lot deeper into why certain reporting motifs or um, these um, uh, these traditions of reporters, why, why they exist, and then why they're violated. And I, I think there's a more of a method to that madness than you may be noticing. What would that method of the madness be? Because I, I don't know really how journalism works in the United States. When I went to broadcasting school in Vancouver, we were loaded up with instructors from who had spent literally, oh, between the the six of them, probably close to 180 years at the CBC, which is Canada's Crown Corporation for Journalism, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And they were extremely staunch on playing the middle. You don't go left, you don't go right, you report the news, you report the facts, you report what you are seeing. Paint a picture for your audience, whether you're on television, a little bit harder to do when you're on radio. At no time were we trained on the new concept that started in the early 2000s of infotainment. We weren't okay. tra- trained. Go ahead. But it's not that new, though. It's not that new. And this is, so let me, first of all, I know little not nearly enough as i should about about the traditions of canadian broadcasting and journalism but let me but let me say the diff, one of the fundamental differences is reflected in the fact that there is no american equivalent of the cdc and when the when the fcc um ha, there was a choice that this country made um when licensure of radio stations in particular began and that decision was based on letting the market decide. There had been a discussion about having a state-owned media. Um, certainly that was what the Brits were already doing, and it was already happening in a couple places, other places in Europe. But there was a, there was a decision based on our kind of American, our u- somewhat unique American viewpoint about, about, about market-driven 
um, commodities like media, that it was going to be better to let the let the industry decide how it was going to be, and the FCC was going to be left up to only being the referee on the technical side, so that there weren't two stations broadcasting, you know, at 790 on the AM dial, that kind of thing. So that, you know, you weren't, that, that was all, that, that was their only job. And content was going to be left up to the purveyors. So right away, you, you, perhaps you could say in Canada, you had an advantage. And you could say that Canadian broadcasters, they, they could be purists, because there was a distinct horizon line of what would be acceptable and it was going to be maintained almost in the same way that any other state function could be maintained, right? A kind of uniformity right. that just did, never existed in the United States, ever. And in fact, our model for media is much more like the model that existed for print in the 1800s, which was not fewer and better, but more and worse. So, you know, there were literally in, in major cities like Chicago, there were 150 newspapers, daily newspapers. And, and people, incredible. yeah, it, it's, you, it's staggering to think that they had the daily Swedish communist and they had the daily Swedish patriot, one of which was in English and the other was in Swedish. I'm sort of making up these names, but you get the idea. There's the Pol there would be a Polish newspaper that was English language. There was one that would be in Polish, um, and there would be some that were right away. They, 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 you know, they advertised their leanings in the title of the of the newspaper. They they were unabashedly Democrat or Republican or you know about ten other different types of political parties would have. That would be the first thing you would do is start your own newspaper. And so this is, and, and, and the news that was being filtered through those newspapers was, you know, obviously ground through the lens of whatever it was that that, that paper represented, which is how we get the Chicago Tribune. The Chicago Tribune was the Republican newspaper, and it was going to represent the views of abolitionists which is kind of funny. We, we don't necessarily think about it that way, but that's what the, and the, the Chicago Tribune got right behind Abraham Lincoln. And they, they helped, the Chicago Tribune helped elect Abraham Lincoln. Chicago Tribune was not much older than Abraham Lincoln when he became president of the United States. And that connection between party, politics, and papers, that, that still existed well into say the 40s or 50s, when the market changed, and now you had cities where they might have four newspapers. So now it was in their best interest to represent as many different opinions and not just one. And that's where a lot of this idea about, uh, about being objective and not, you know, just everybody it, not claiming a side, at least not overtly, that that's how that becomes popularized. It's, it's really because... You know, there just there was less competition. You had to get as many people out there as you could. Do you think, though, that money and advertising, though, has really changed the face of what is happening? Well, yeah. I mean, it drives. It's always driven it in the United States. I don't know about Canada, but yeah. well, I mean, the commercial time is is something that it drives every media corporation let's face it that's how they make their money i mean by the right. ratings go up you literally can charge more per second because seconds right. are extremely i mean you know from being behind the mic sure. how long a second actually is and most people <laughs> really do not know how long a second truly is but when you sit there and you see you know do you see on on your side or what you're viewing as you're being constructive right. about about what is happening do you see you know advertisers making their way saying you know what you won't i'm throwing you all this money i'm not going to be allowing you to report anything bad about my company do you see things like that happening i've 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 never experienced that the the closest i've ever come to that was when we knew say when we had a an agreement with an advertiser that would be like an airline that if there was a crash of any airline that we would immediately pull all the spots 
um, so that they didn't want to they didn't want to take a chance of running an airline commercial on a newscast about a plane crash, even if it wasn't one of theirs. Um, there were considerations like that. Um, I, I personally, and I and let me just say too. So uh, most of what I've done and had the most fun with um, was on the opinion side of topical news coverage as opposed to being a straight journalist. I have done that from time to time. And I was a news director for a brief period of time, about a year and a half. And I, and I effectively changed everything I did to follow that, you know, what was the expectations of that position. I don't happen to find that very hard. And I think that's part of the problem. I, I think journalism, when you're, when you're just reporting facts somewhat antiseptically, even if you're writing it colorfully, and you're just trying to report, you know, there was a there was a shooting today, and there was this, and then this happened, and then that happened afterward. To me, reporting of facts is is less interesting than 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 pursuing truth. And I say truth, full, knowing full well that that's a subjective concept anyway. But I think that to me, for example, that's what's very interesting about true crime is that true crime, one of the defining differences between crime reporting and true crime is that when you've got a, a book form or a magazine long form that you can work with several thousand words as opposed to several hundred, you can really start to look for the contexts of crimes and what the impacts are to the community. And I find that much more interesting to me than just it happened and this is where it happened and this is the people to whom it happened, which while sad, and helpful, um, it doesn't it doesn't inform me very deeply, and I think that what you're seeing is, you know, we we really just have so many different ways of conveying information, and you can watch Sean Hannity, and you can see Sean Hannity's view of Hillary Clinton, um, and his view of Hillary Clinton will be extremely critical and maybe even slightly paranoid about her abilities to kill people and or whatever. Um, but then you can watch somebody over on MSNBC and you can see a small halo over Hillary Clinton as she's portrayed as being a victim. And I think that's just the way it should be. It just, it's, up to the, it's up to the viewer, it's up to the reader, it's up to the listener to use their critical minds and engage in whether or not they accept that particular point of view and whether that, that story sounds more plausible than the others. There's also a lot of people, though, and you probably saw it in your coast-to-coast days, who believe the media is infiltrated because most of the mainstream media in the United States is owned by six major corporations, and they Not feel... True. That's a myth. That's a myth. Uh, okay. I, I, I may, I, I, no, no, I, I don't mean to be rude about that, and I'm sorry, but I do think there's a lot more diversity out there, and I think comes right down to it is the Internet has just smashed all of that. Right. Right. When was the last time you honestly had an opinion that was formed for you by the media? Personally, I I yeah. agree. I agree with you. I agree okay. with you on that. But I well, have. Where's a... anybody? Find anybody who has. You know, I mean, I think that's the difference. We think everybody else is being influenced, not us, not you, not me, but everybody else is. But it really isn't. And I think that what we have is you have media that are echo effects. They are mutual confirmation societies, right? Fox News confirms a worldview that, that started that day and will end that day. CNN, in their attempt to be perhaps a little more objective, but still, in the way they line up you know, commentators and the way that they pursue a story, it reflects a worldview that will be there on, available 24-7. And people will go to any of these different outlets because they're looking for confirmation that they're right. <laughs> they don't go to you don't go to some place that's going to tell you you're crazy. Who who has time for that? <laughs> oh, I fully agree with you. And when I worked in a newsroom, never once did we have a story pulled because there was something that the government had right. had told us, oh, you can't Ever. cover that that UFO sighting that was over the right. mountains of Vancouver. You, you you never got that. And yet people out there, especially in the fringe, they believe that there is something totally, totally biased that the gu- that is being hidden by journalists. Okay, wait a second, but let's stop. It is biased because we're not robots. 
<laughs> right? We're not news bots. We, we're not just, you know, we, we can't even, any of our filters are never clear enough to be purely unbiased. We will come at every story with the accumulative effect of our upbringings, of our religion. But uh, we have the voice of our mother in our head sometimes when we're doing a story. Um, but I, but that's so we're always going to be a little biased. The question is, are we owned by something? And that's your point. And I think that's what I I just I can't agree more. We there was no there's never a time I've never it's going to be forty years of doing media never got a call <laughs> any time from anybody in the government or anybody even in my company. The only time I got a call from, I, I'm trying to think of, I worked for a guy who was really didn't believe in global warming, and when I made a comment about global warming, he sent me a pamphlet. But he never told me I can't say it. He never said I shouldn't. He just said, I think there's another point of view you're not considering. And I was like, okay, well, that's good to know. But that's about it, you know. And I, and I think, or and, and maybe I, I swore once or twice, and I, I got a, a note on alternative vocabulary suggestions for the next time I was on the air, <laughs> something like that. But that's about it. We are talking with Ian Punnett tonight on Spaced Out Radio. His latest book can be found on acclaimpress.com, A Black Night for the Bluegrass Bell. It's a true crime book. I think you would enjoy it. Head to acclaimpress.com and find it Thank today. You. Ian. I have a question from a member of the audience in the Revolution Radio chat room, and I'm sure you'll enjoy this question as a flashback. Are there any cryptids, such as demons, fallen angels, aliens, etc., in government and or media positions? Uh, Love to meet them. I mean, there's plenty of reason to suspect there are. (laughs) Let me see it. And I I would, you know, these are one of those... That's one of those subjects where the the question is always more interesting than the answer, um, and I fear that that I will just uh, repeat that paradigm because I I I can't imagine that there are. But boy, what a cool idea! Wouldn't that be neat if we could uncover something like that? Uh, it would just make life so much more interesting, and it would explain so much. But I think most people, I think that the 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 sadness to me, perhaps, or the greatness of doing you know, this type of radio and to do coast to coast that I did for many years was the, the it, it allowed us to free our imaginations to seek alternative explanations for why things are so screwy. You know, it's like that that would make a kind of sense. And it was fun to pursue it. Unfortunately I could you know, the it, it's the mundane it's the mundacity of it all, I think that can sometimes be somewhat crushing. Because it's really just a lot of people who are just trying to keep a government job, they're just trying to pay the rent, they're trying to get their kid through college, they make dumb mistakes, they, they're they more afraid of getting fired, um, you know, and so I think that's where a lot of our incompetence comes from, is people who are constantly covering up for weakness in government, not, not because they have any supernatural power. Wish they did. Well, here's another comment from Zop in the Re- Revolution Radio chat room saying, Dave, you and Ian trained before the Internet when most of us had no way of knowing the scale of poisonings and deceptions by the government. What's your now, take you on that? You tell me. What do you, 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 you go first. I, I think I would look at that and I would say, up here in Canada, I really don't see that happening. I don't see lizards running around or the government knocking off people because we're way too interested in trying to change the wording from all thy sons command to all of us command in the national anthem as we grow more politically correct up here. Wait, wait, stop. Is that politically correct? Here's my take on that. Okay. I think it is. I think politically correct has become one of these really, oh. really abused terms. So go ahead. Why? Tell me about that. The line "All Thy Sons Command" was written for, I believe, the soldiers that were heading to war to protect the Dominion of Canada, because Canada wasn't an official country back then. It was st- still a state, okay? So the line, All Thy Sons Command, was the Canadian boys that were going off to war, many of them not coming back, 
okay, and we look at the at the big uh, battles that we fought, whether it was Dieppe, Passchendaele, whether it was crashing the beaches of Normandy with the United States and breaking right. through those barriers, okay, and to take that out of the national anthem, to put that to all of us command, to me, that is a slap in the face of the history of what helped build this country. Okay. So, f- fair opinion, if we look at anthems as only historical. But fair enough. Anthems traditionally have always been a present tense experience. You're trying to get everybody on the same page. A national anthem, a pledge of allegiance, is not a historical recitation. But it's like, if you'll pardon me making a religious reference, it's like communion. Communion is not commemorative. Communion is supposed to be, in the Christian church, a present tense experience. You are connecting to the saints that have come before us, but we're also connecting to the saints that have yet to be born. So it is the idea, if you can imagine, like this big giant table of communion, that's really what that's supposed to be like. So when you're taking the bread and the, and the wine, you are sharing it with both, you know, ghosts, if we look at it that way, of the past who have sacrificed, and, and the glint in the Father's eye of the saints who have yet to be born. And so that, to me, is what anthems are about. National anthems, pledges of allegiance, like I'm, I'm very fond of the Pledge of Allegiance, but it's intended to bring people together and to represent the, the country as it's moving forward, not just looking back. So when you say slap in the face, I, I, can't, I, I certainly understand your point of view on that. But I, I would say we need to always be evolving in our language because we always need, we want, it's our purpose, it's our goal, is to always make sure that everybody is still on the team. And I just want, I want everybody on my team. I'm a, you know, I'm a tribesman. I'm, I was born an American, and that's all there is to it. And, and so I always want people to buy in, and I'm always trying to get people to buy in. And if, if it means changing the language for them to buy in, the greater good is the language got changed. But but I, I, I understand why people think differently on that. Well, you know what? I I see your point, and I see everything. I think in Canada here that everything continues to change because we are a progressive co- country, but there's a lot of people out there who still are trying to live in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s when Canada finally became an official country in 1982. You know, so there's a lot of people who just haven't let go. And Canada is a very, you know, immigration-friendly country. It's a country that continues to develop. You know, not everybody plays hockey anymore. You know, not everybody goes right. hun- hunting for moose anymore. Or Where you the know, national character changes when more people come into the party. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got to put out different snacks. The more people come to the party, you got to put out different snacks. I hear you there. I hear you there. <laughs> I have a question from Matthew in the SOR Space Travelers. A little bit off topic here, but Matthew is asking Ian, what did you think about Glenn Kimball's ideas about the hidden childhood of Jesus? Yeah. So, love. First of all, let me just say thank you for bringing up good old Glenn Kimball. He was the sweetest guy, and I, I I regret not praising him the last time I was given the opportunity to do that. I kicked myself later on, so thank you for the uh, the opportunity to redeem myself. Uh, Glenn Kimball, um, uh, rest in peace. He was a he was a guy who created a, a really interesting industry by finding documents and publications that were in the public domain that were essentially unavailable, and he would repackage them, and he would make, I thought, really nice, he did a really good job of creating a kind of um, alternative library of formally printed material, and some of that um, involved um, lost religious um, 
uh, like hagiographies and and material that had one time been like super popular and everybody read it to the point where it, like he would find these things and find that they had no longer had any publication ownership and he would reprint it and some of what he found were some of the early works of um alternative christian historians um some of whom were gnostics some of whom were in many cases, maybe even, um, you know, they had kind of an antipathy toward Christianity. Um, but he, he found great books that he published, and one of those, some of those had to do with the early life of Jesus. Um, these are not, they weren't new. They weren't unknown. It's just most people didn't have copies of them. And so I loved having him on because he was able to pull out these texts that I'd only read about or would have had to have gone into some archive to find. Uh, and some of those had to do with, uh, you know, these uh, non-canonical, we would call them, um, texts about the life of Jesus, most of which were written hundreds of years after Jesus was had died, which still puts them, you know, fairly early in the story arc of the Christian church, um, somewhere in the third century or something. But he, but he, you know, he, they they were shocking to people because they said things like, uh, I remember um, the first time I ever heard anybody talk about the stories about Jesus as a child, and how these had become very popular stories about how he would kill an animal. I can't almost say it without laughing, that he would kill an animal just to bring it back from the dead, just to, just to make just to freak out the other kids, which I think is such a funny idea. I've seen it referenced many times since then. Um, it, it even came up in something on HBO not too long ago, um, and I so you know. Gosh, I, it, what I, that's what I loved about Glenn. And no, I was never offended by it. And it was, I think it's somewhat, it, it, we're, we're, we need more people like that who are out recovering those, uh, those lost uh, volumes. I have a comment from Robert Rose for you in the SOR Space Travelers on Facebook. He says, Ian, I have to say that weekends of listening to Coast and hearing you bring back very fond memories. Thank you. Don't you hear me bloviate again? <laughs> Brings back fond memories. Good. I wish my wife felt that way. Um, yeah, you know, and I, I'm kind of glad I'm not on during this political season, too. I think that may be taking some of the fun out of radio in general, um, the way things are going. Um, but because I, I just never thought of Coast to Coast as a very binary show, where it's either one way or another. And um, and so that's where things are a little bit online these days in in, in the news media. So um, I I I think very fondly of of the time that I spent on the air doing coast to coast, and um, it's nice to hear it. I'm not the only one who remembers it probably better than it was. <laughs> Do you mind if I ask you a question about coast? I, I usually don't bring them up because you know we're in the same same time slot as them, and it's just kind of a radio thing not to do. But I'm sure. curious. When my when I got addicted to Coast, when Art was hosting, and every yeah. night it was just a, a a weird topic after weird topic type of night, there wasn't a lot of political talk or as much. There wasn't a lot of banter about food and GMOs and everything. Do you miss the Coast that a lot of listeners miss, which was, you know, about those darker, weirder topics compared to today when it seems a lot more, I hate to use the word commercial, but I'm going to use that? That's uh, an interesting way of looking at it. Okay, well, I would parallel my conversation about Coast to our conversation we just had about O Canada, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say, again, things just evolve. And it, it, we can be nostalgic about them, but we can't ever go back and be in them again. And the second we're done with it is the second it's done with us. And we have to move on. It's in the ether, right? It's drifting out toward Mars. There's nothing we can do about it. So when I did Coast to Coast, I, 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 the first time I started to do Coast to Coast was back at a, at a fairly magical period, I think, in the history of, of radio and, and overnight radio anyway. And that was this. Art had already evolved from being a political show. And Coast to Coast came on the air as a political show. It came on the air representing arts, libertarian, political views. And the first, the show was originally five hours, and I did it back in the days when it was five hours long. 
Um, and it was five hours long to account for all of the time zone changes across America. And the, uh, the, the show would come on, and Art, for the first four hours, really, would do a fairly straight meat and potatoes, libertarian type of show. Very few people remember those shows because they weren't syndicated so much back then. They, were, they had a fairly local appeal. And then he started doing, he started taking these open calls toward the end of the show. Again, five hours long. You gotta, you know, gotta do something. And so when Art would do that, um, he started to getting, he started getting calls from people who were reflecting that wonderful libertarian spirit of thinking outside of the box. And it, they started talking about things that were not. Um, uh, perhaps traditional in talk radio at that time. If you go back, by the way, about uh, about 20 years, 30 years, you'll find radio hosts who had done paranormal overnight radio. Um, Long John Nebel, I think, was the guy that was best known for it. But Art kind of resurrected that tradition, and he did it through his um, libertarian POV, by talking about the stuff that other people found unacceptable. So that became, why not think about ghosts? Why not think, do we think the government is hiding information about UFOs? Well, of course we do. And, and the government, you can't trust the government. And so it was, it was really kind of magical how that took over the political conversation. And within, well, I don't know what the timeline is. I'd have to ask. But in fairly short order, it flipped. And pretty soon he was doing four hours of paranormal, um, and out of the box kind of alternative history, alternative medicine, that kind of thing. And then like one hour of libertarian politics at the end. And then that just disappeared completely. Because by the time I came on, that sort of spirit of libertarianism existed within the show, but it, it was never political. So, and then, you know, everybody else kind of cobbled a part of the show for themselves. And all all this TV product came on with the explosion of cable channels and and satellite channels and and everybody started to borrow from coast to coast and you know if if coast to coast to stay fresh goes into areas it had never had to go go into before it's just because in a way everybody else is doing it. How many ghost shows are on TV right now? Like ten. <laughs> There weren't any in the, you know, in the, in the 90s when it started. How many shows are dealing with alternative religious history or you know, uh, conspiracy theories in general? They're everywhere. So what do, what do you do to keep a show fresh? Um, you kind of have to go in, in directions that other people aren't going in. And if there's one thing you would say about Coast to Coast, it's that the show always zigged while everybody else zagged. And as soon as everybody else was talking about, like, bees, that's when we would stop talking about it, you know? It's like, everybody else is doing it, now we're done. That's intriguing. That yeah, I, I'm smiling here because I always wanted to know the answer to that. And to be able to hear it from, you know, hand inside the cookie jar, it's, it's great yeah. for us to be able to actually hear that. I have a couple more questions we have about... about uh, I'm going to say 10 minutes before or eight minutes before we have to go to break here. Eric is wondering in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker, he's saying, Ian, you've been involved with what many considered fringe media. What yep. is or was your technique for choosing sources on the far more fetched, on the more far fetched stories? <sighs> Love that question. Love that question. First of all, I'm flattered that anybody wants to know my opinion on anything. So, I'm just grateful there that I'm not sitting here tell, just having to tell stories about the dog that's sitting in my lap right now. Um, so I, there, I, I believe that the bolder the claim, the greater the need for sourcing. And that was, uh, that is the, because the show has its own credibility, right? Your show right now, you have your own credibility. And if you, when you, anytime you have a guest on, the, if the guest takes away from your credibility, it's a failed guest. If people walk away thinking less of you by the person they had on the air, then you didn't win. The guest won because they were able to siphon off your credibility 
to bolster their own, you know, whatever the whatever it is that they're trying to sell. So for me, I love fringe, and fringe to me just frequently means just people who aren't included. It doesn't mean crazy. It just means people who who haven't become accepted. They're people on the porch, and they're looking for the door in to acceptability, and they just want to make their case. And to me, the important thing was, do they come with their own credibility? Can they back up their claim at all? Um, or is it just going to be something they're going to blather on and on about, or that they're going to put it together from somebody else's sources, which I always objected to. And I see that online all the time, where somebody's, you know, they come up with a book, and my book is da 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 And all it is is just reconstituted material from other people's research. It's not original. And it's just, you know, that, that's the kind of thing I avoided as much as possible. So I hope I'm answering the question to say I loved the, – the more somebody had, you know, in their book, they footnoted their sources. They did primary research. Um, I don't care how fringe you are. If you actually got up off your butt and you went to the place that you were writing about and you made personal observations, you were already going down a good road for me as a guest. And that's why so many of my guests I would have back over and over again because I benefited from having them on. They, they helped, they, they bolstered the show's credibility. They brought authenticity to their argument, um, regardless of what the argument was. Um, and I can think of plenty of people who are, you know, wrote about alternative history. They wrote about Nazis, you know, the rat line, and, or they wrote about conspiracies, wrote about JFK, and they actually did primary research. They went out and found new people. They interviewed them. They found new sources, and they brought them to the table. That always wins with me. I'm going to continue on here with questions. We've got about four, five minutes left before we got to go to break. Joe is asking in the SOR Space Travelers, and he, Joe usually keeps pretty quiet, but sometimes he, you know, he goes off like a Gatlin gun here, and he's going off here. He's saying, Ian, do you believe in Bigfoot? Ever seen a UFO? Are aliens visiting? Yes. Yeah. I've seen a UFO. Very famously saw a UFO. Now, do I know what it was? No. And I've never seen, you know, I, I haven't seen, I, I, don't know, I, I don't know whether it was, you know, to borrow the phrase, I don't know if it were Martians, but I saw a constellation of UFOs, yeah. And that changes your life. Yes, it does. You know. Yes, it does. You, see, you can't explain it. What can you do? You know, I mean, you just, you're kind of, you're always, and to me, I don't know about you, but it always, op- it, it completely opened me up to other weird stuff that other people saw that I had never seen. <laughs> you know? And so when people telling me about that, I'm like, wow, that's cool. Here's what I saw. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I've never seen Bigfoot. Wish I did. Uh, I've been through some ghost hunts, saw some things that kind of gave me the creepy crawlies. Um, I've, I've, I've made an effort to kind of go out and experience some things, but I also don't want to be a tourist about it where, you know, I was making, I'm going out to find something, because inevitably, if you pay enough, you'll feel like you need to find it. Um, so I, I like the experiences that come to me better. But, yeah, there you go. Joe also, so far. <laughs> <laughs> Joe also wants to know, do you think the Illuminati is real? And, by the no. way, what what no. is your... No. no. The Illuminati was real. It was a real organization. And it really did exist. But this whole idea somehow that it still exists, just please, God, somebody prove it. You know, I just, that's the thing. I just, there's no proof of that. It's, it's one of the greatest names of all time. I mean, I think we should keep talking about the Illuminati just because I love the word Illuminati. <laughs> it's the greatest name. But no, I don't think any of our lives are being managed. I don't think history is being influenced by the historical group, the Illuminati, although they did exist. Well, I can... I'm firm on stuff like that. There's some things I'm... Because I've researched the hell out of it. Because I would love to think it's true. And I absolutely... I come up with nothing every time. And Joe has one final question for you. What's your favorite late-night snack? Apparently this is important to him. (laughs) You know, I have to say I'm a salty sweet guy. 
So that is always my. So if you have like uh, kettle corn, <laughs> I'm I have no natural immunity to anything that's salty and sweet. And that was I, I would have I would munch on stuff like that when I was doing late night radio because I, I guess I can't make up my mind do I want savory or do I want dessert? I'll have them both. So that's kind of where I am. So popcorn, that kind of thing. We have about Chocolate a minute. covered pretzels. Oh, oh, very very pretzels. nice. Very that's nice. Awesome. We got about a minute left here uh, before we go to break. Quickly, what is the strangest story that you ever heard while hosting Coast to Coast? Okay, so if I'm, how can I do that in sixty seconds? I okay. can't even tell you the breaking time in under five minutes. You've asked me. I give these very long answers. I'll never be able to do All that right. one let, let, at the top of the hour. Let's save that. Let's save that one until we come back from break because I, I I'm curious to hear that because. I've heard some pretty strange ones here, you know, and sometimes they just make you scratch your head. Did you ever have your microphone off and were just killing yourself laughing? Just, you got to be kidding me. You know, just kind of. I'll tell you a, I'll tell you a story about my microphone being on when I couldn't stop laughing that I just remembered the other day. I'll All right. Story. Well, let's go, let's go to break right now. You're listening to Space Out Radio. Our guest is Ian Punnett tonight. We'll be right back right after this break. Looking for news beyond the mainstream news? Head to spacedoutradio.com and check out the SOR Spacewire. This is Spaced Out Radio's Eric Markham, news director for the SOR Spacewire. Daily, I will bring you intriguing stories and outlandish reports from what's going on around the world. UFO sightings, paranormal activity, conspiracies, alternative health, and so much more. And if you have news, email me at news at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with Euphorcop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. Have you ever wondered about those weird and strange creatures people have reported throughout history? Do you wonder if those stories are real? Me too, and that's why I started Cryptopia.us. Hey, this is Rob Morphy, crypto historian. Join me once a month on Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott where we will get into the odd and bizarre reports from the Dover Demon to Harry Hominids and everything in between. I will break down what people like you and me are seeing at spacedoutradio.com. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, How can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy. And I would love it if you join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between. Hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There. You will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us. From radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. 
Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com where I, Vincent Zunza, and my super sleuth partner, Alexandra Sullivan, track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest. From Bigfoot to Mel's Hole and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, there's only one way to rock. Loud and proud. In high definition. Radio 702 Rocks. Las Vegas. Have you ever had an extraterrestrial experience? One you just couldn't explain? Well, maybe I can help. Hello, I am Samantha Mullet. On the second Tuesday of each month, I will join Dave Scott on Space Out Radio to bring a human aspect to ET contact. It's something I've lived with my entire life, and I'd love to help you understand. Let's share our experiences. The ET experience, the second Tuesday of each month, only on Space Out Radio. Hi there, this is Jolene with Reveal at Reiki and Readings, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. Spacedoutradio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Hi there, this is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large. Heard only on Space Out Weekend at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members-only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. Do you have a topic or a guest that you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Let us know at spacedoutradio.com where you can sign up to become a Space Traveler member today. Or you can find us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the show, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time, we will be talking with Lori McDonald. We are going to be discussing hypnotherapy when it comes to people who have been abducted by extraterrestrials. That is tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Hey, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. While there, you can definitely check out the SOR Space Travelers Club. It's only 5 bucks a month. With that, you get access to a private section on our website, private group interviews, your name goes into monthly prize draws, and so much more. Check out the SOR Space Wire if you want the weird and the strange and the wacky and news. You can read my latest blog and the blogs of our team members, and you can check out our music master, the guitar god himself, Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, who does all of our Spaced Out Radio music. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers. It is Scrivener. Scrivener is your password. If you are a space traveler, make sure you use it very wisely. Tonight we are talking with Ian Punnett, former host of Coast to Coast AM Weekends. He is now a dedicated author. His latest book 
you can find on acclaimpress.com. A Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell. It's a true crime book. Ian, welcome back. Thank you. Is uh, Scrivener in reference to Bartleby the Scrivener? I will have to find out from Bill. He's usually pretty creative. Usually he tries the, to throw me off. It's an early early kind of spooky story from uh, uh, Herman Melville, wasn't it? I think. Melville? I think so. It could have been. Bartleby could. the Scrivener. It's a cool story. We're getting a ton of questions from our audience, and I want to make sure we get them all in before, because we only have you until the top of the hour here. Right before the break, I asked you a question about your strangest story that you were ever told. And, you know, one of those that you probably couldn't get to the mute button fast enough. Fill us in on that. No, yeah, but that, okay, so first, by the way, I have a platinum record from uh, Guns N' Roses on my wall. Oh. Use your, from your, from Use Your Illusion. So before Bumblefoot played with them, but... Um, I, I, when I was still a rock, now I bow. Yet, now I, I bow to you. I a platinum album for that. I, I bow to you for that. I bow. That cool. Um, so yeah, okay. So like, first of all, let me just say, this will only be funny to me, and it is a strange story. It is not. It is not coast to coast. Uh, it happened to me on the radio and you mentioned laughing uncontrollably so then here's this so and let, i just say i crack myself up all the time and i i have i have i'm an idiot with sometimes with my own jokes nobody else finds them as funny as i do i full I, it's fine i am my best audience and i occasionally heckle myself too um so I will, I will give you an example of that. By the way, I told you I got robbed, right? In um, I, yes, in uh, in Albuquerque, right? So yes. Which to me, actually, kind of cracked me up in its own way, just from the the pure Bugs Bunniness of having something significant happen in Albuquerque, because you know he was always Bugs Bunny was always talking about taking a wrong turn in Albuquerque, and so here I, I had my wallet, my iPhone, I had my identity stolen in Albuquerque as I was. Uh, driving to my uh, new teaching position here at Ohio Northern University. So it was just kind of cracking me up. And then I, for some reason, I got into the subject of, um, you know, the the old expression and song lyric about shooting a man in Reno just to watch him die, right? And I thought, I don't know why, but I started, I started, I love the idea of shooting a man in Reno just to watch him cry, which just seemed kind of meaner, you <laughs> just sitting there watching somebody cry after you shoot them. <laughs> and so I, I literally, even though I'd lost my wallet and my iPhone, I laughed for about 100 miles just laughing at that idea of shot a man in Reno just to watch him cry. I still laugh at that. So I'm just saying, up front, I say dumb stuff, but it makes me laugh. So I was on the air doing the news. This would have been in, I was working for a station in Waukegan, Illinois, I was working my way through college, and I had a newscast at the top of the hour. And so we did the standard kind of, you know, rip and read, two national headlines, a local story, a kicker, weather out. So I, I pulled the, we had the, the two national stories, did the local story, and then I had the kicker was a story that had come from the National Enquirer about a guy, a farmer, who had been hit by lightning while he was chasing a, his his pet chicken around the backyard um, to bring it in from a thunderstorm. It wasn't just any chicken. It was his pet chicken. And the reason why it took him so long to get the chicken in the house is the guy was, was, was virtually blind. So the, the storm comes up. The thunder is happening. The chicken's turning around. The blind guy's chasing after the chicken, and he gets hit by lightning. Now, the story was, and this was kind of the cool part that the Inquirer was reporting, is that he, um, he, when he was hit by lightning, it corrected his vision. And for the first time in, like, uh, umpteen years, he was able, he had virtually 20-20 vision again. And then the story I was actually reading was an update on that story that said, remember the guy who got his vision back after being hit by lightning chasing his chicken around the backyard? Well, as it turns out, for the first time 
in 20 years, he's growing hair again. And the story was came with a photo um, that cleared the wire of this guy, and he had hair growing on top of his head that all happened from having been hit by lightning. So I said on the air, I said, yeah, but what they don't tell you is now the chicken is balding and he needs glasses. <laughs> now, again, I know I just like cracked my... I started laughing uncontrollably on the air. I thought that was the funniest damn thing I'd ever said. And I still have fun now. I couldn't... I couldn't talk. My voice went up into this, like, you know, castrati register where I was just talking like this. I was laughing so hard. And I had nothing queued up. I didn't, I had, I kind of looked, I sort of looked down. I realized I'd gotten distracted and I didn't have any commercials in the, you know, I didn't have anything, I didn't have any carts in. I didn't have any records queued up. I had nothing to go to. So now I'm just laughing myself and I'm stuck because I have to then go find a record and put it on and I'm literally kind of wetting myself on the air laughing about that which like I said it's not a story I could tell in 60 seconds and I acknowledged up front that only I think it's that funny but I, the idea that the chicken is balding and he needs glasses still makes me laugh to this day funniest story that ever happened to me on the air I was reading a sports cast because I was a sports journalist some in- yeah. insignificant July baseball game and I It was an American League game. I think it was, you know, I don't know, let's say Boston and Chicago. Well, I come on the air, and I call the Chicago losing to the Chicago White Cox instead of the White Sox on the air. (laughs) The entire newsroom, I can hear them behind me through my headphones, killing themselves laughing. And hear your red face, because, you know, in Vancouver, we were speaking, our audience was about 400,000 a day. And you're you're like, oh, no, the phones are going to ring. And sure sure enough, as soon as you get off the sports cast, here come the phones. You know, you know, you mispronounced that, right? (laughs) Yes. And then you say, no, I didn't. That's exactly what I meant to say. (laughs) (laughs) Try that. (laughs) Take an offensive position and see what they're. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. I love that. I sometimes do this on purpose. I've had this little joke where somebody asks me if they don't, you know, they don't know I'm going to get my PhD or they don't and I'll just be talking to somebody usually I I like to do this with with women um, who ask me so what do you do and I and I, and I say dead up, deadpan look him right in the eye and I say I run a billion dollar hedgehog and somehow they filter out the word hedgehog for hedge fund and so they think oh well, that's that's really good <laughs> A billion dollar hedge fund, and I'll, I'll actually say it again, and I'll say, "No, a billion dollar hedgehog." And for some reason, they just they, they don't, the hedgehog part doesn't register, or if it does, it seems kind of delayed and they're sort of confused. But I, I love doing that just to see what people do afterward. Oh again, man, I make myself laugh again. So sorry. Oh, don't apologize. That's very Canadian of you for being an American. <laughs> I, I want to ask you, Coast to Coast really spawned an entire generation, along with the internet as it grew, to all of these fringe and alternative radio and television stations. Okay, we have, you know, whether you're listening here where we broadcast off of, of Spreaker or Revolution Radio or High Plains Radio or Blog Talk Radio, it really did a, a whole benefit to the underground being able to now broadcast their opinions, albeit pay for it, instead of being paid for it. What do you think about this whole fringe media that has grown into this giant anomaly? Well, it's not a fringe anymore, is it? You know, I mean, that's that. I guess if there's a, a shame to it, it's that it, there's a kind of thing, you know, this this we go through this process all the time where, something grows really big and then it breaks off into sects and those sects then grow big and eventually they break off. And this is just a, it's a process that it's called the, the um, you know, kind of the cult to sex um, phenomenon. I, 
I, I see it everywhere. Coast to Coast is a great example of that. The, the topic of paranormal uh, uh, media is that. But it really comes down to this, is that at what point do we even stop using the term paranormal? You know, if we talk about paranormal as around normal, okay, do we talk supernatural as something above natural, something that is extra natural? At some point, at some point, I, I mean, just think vocabulary is important. If so many people are having these experiences, when is it just natural? It may be weird. It may be an experience that's extraordinary, but is it extra natural? Um, and I, 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 I think that one thing we've seen, if there's any, if there's any confirmation of this, is that so many people have these experiences that they want to share and understand. Um, it's more than just gawking at, you know, highway fires, which, by the way, I, it's my favorite thing. Car fires on the highway are awesome. As long as nobody's hurt, the best. And it's been that. It's, it's looking at, it, we, must, we must recognize that this is much more mainstream. And it really, it, it may have been fringe to polite society, but it's not that way anymore. Do you think there's too much, Ian? Do you think that it's oversaturated now? Well, is it too much to do what? You know, is it too much to make a living at doing? Yeah, probably. I mean, I, I was fortunate um, to be in a different position. But I, I think for people to, you, you, when you, if everybody's going to be slicing up the pie, I mean, it's like anything. There's, you know, there's a million blogs out there about politics, and who can ever aggregate an audience large enough to monetize it in a way that makes it, it goes from being an avocation to a vocation. I'm not sure. But I, I, I do think, you know, I just think when you look at the totality of it, I think it's really cool. And it, it's neat to flip around and see some people do it really badly, but they've got interesting things to say. And some people are really slick, but they've got nothing to say. And I, I think that it's kind of fun to, to see where, you know, kind of where all those seeds maybe of coast to coast have uh, taken root in between rocks and cobblestones and sometimes in very fertile fields. I guess what I'm asking is, do you feel that the message is being relayed enough with, let's say, these paranormal shows, these ghost shows, you've got the fringe Bigfoot shows, you've got the UFO shows, you have everything for everybody out there, for every medium, instead of focusing in. It's more about the quantity of everything, rather than back in the day, where people used to have to listen, or in order to get the message out, you had to have some quality behind the broadcast. Well, I think this is a really good point. So quantity, the demand will always lower the quality. And I think what you have is in order to fulfill, say, TV obligations. Well, I'm not naming names, but you know there are, some, there are some programs out there that just fake it. They don't have anything. You know, they've got to produce X number of shows. So what are you going to do? You're going to hire somebody to, you know, some PA somewhere is going to dress all in black, and when no one's looking, you'll know, throw a Frisbee across the sky or something and go, look! You know, I mean, that's, that's what we got. I mean, I think that's, this is what, and this is what was a problem even for Coast to Coast to a degree, is that there, we can't make, you can't make the paranormal. You can't make new witnesses. You can't make new experiences. We, you know, you, I'm sure you'd agree. You are beholden to people who are authentically doing research or who have had some experience you know, that they are willing to discuss. If they don't, what do you got? You, know, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't order up something, which is what people used to do. Uh, they would complain sometimes and say, well, I want more shows about such and such. And I think, well, that's great, because we've done that show like 10 times. So give me another guest who can come on and talk about that, and I would do it so fast. But I can't just make one. I can't just hire somebody. And, but then, as you point out, you know, quality is such, you know, that it, it, unfortunately, 
you know, there are people out there who sort of gotten in the business of the supply side of this, and they'll make up anything, and they'll they'll put out a lot of crap, and they'll find a way to make money on it. But yeah, it 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 it, it that kind of quantity of programming does lower the overall quality of the uh, sub subject matter. We've only been doing this since November 30th, 2014, and I would say, you know, we're still relatively, you know, taking baby steps here in order to try and get the whole broadcast out there. I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, is, and what I'm trying to focus on now, is how do you get the audience, because there is so much competition out there. Oh, that's good, too. How do you get the audience to make that emotional commitment? Because be authentic. Just be authentic. That's all you can do. We can't make anybody do anything. But you can be, you are you. you know, I could tell that right away just by listening to you. And that, that's, all you, that's all any of us have. Don't be a tourist. Don't be a huckster. Give it time. Every radio show, every really good radio show takes three to five years to find a, an audience. So you're right on track. I appreciate that. I'm going to take that. You know, sometimes. I I mean, yeah. No, I I really do appreciate that because that is probably the hardest thing to do is trying to find the people to make that emotional commitment to your show because time is so valuable today. Everybody's running out of time, you know, in their day as we become more of a 24-hour society. Well, that's, you know, I think, let's just be clear, nobody wants... You don't, I don't, nobody wants anybody to waste our time. So what inevitably what happens on a lot of these shows that I hear and, and I, I don't know, this, I don't, I, I can't even think of one. Well, I can think of a podcast I was listening to that this was especially true on. And the, the host just kind of felt like it was, he was going to take 10 minutes to get to the topic because he felt like it. Now I'm, I'm, uh, you know, people might think that I have a tendency to go on and on, and I, I get that. But I, I try to, in everything, I always try to cut to the chase as quickly as possible, restate where we are, let's talk about what we're talking about, and get back to it. To get to the protein was always what I was interested in. If I wasn't always successful, I apologize, but I always wanted that. And I think this is where you know, we, we have to be as broadcasters, we have to be as anything is we have to get to it as quickly as possible because the competition for our attention is just, you know, it's so diverse. So yeah, you know, no matter what it is, better to do a one hour podcast that's just protein packed than to spill it out over three hours because you all, you know, somebody's ego wants to be on for three hours. It's not about them. It's about the audience. And it's all about. It's always about not wasting the audience's time. We are talking with Ian Punnett tonight on Spaced Out Radio. You can find his new book on acclaimpress.com, A Black Night for the Bluegrass Bell. It is a true crime book. I highly suggest you go over to Acclaim Press after this show and find it today. It would be a good read yeah, for the, you. The, thank you. You know, the story is, is about a woman who was murdered in 1936, um, and she was murdered by the former lieutenant governor of Kentucky, and um, it was on a it was on a very dark night on an open road, um, and with his gun, and it there was an early case. It was an early legal case uh, using forensic evidence um, to a fairly unsophisticated jury. Um, and the woman who was murdered um, was my um, was my grandmother's cousin, and and this story has been very you know it's been sort of central to my upbringing. People we've been talking about her and, and the injustice of what happened, and then ultimately the justice uh, that the family received. But um, it was it's an interesting story of power and how much political power and. Uh, the power of personality um, can persuade people, um, and uh, Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell benefited greatly from having um, from the from two transcripts of the trials from 1937 having been recently rediscovered. So I have I had the two trial transcripts to work with, and they were amazing. 
How much fun was that to delve into your own family's history? Awesome. Awesome. Especially because I'm Southern by nature and Southern United States by nature. So I love family stuff and, and um, I love writing about the kind of, you know, there's, a, there's a, an economy in the Southern United States about family. And what your family name is can determine greatly how successful you'll be and this this even means in, with people who don't have any money at all but if they have the right name that they have a small advantage over somebody else and so it was really cool to get into the these sort of idiosatic, idiosyncratic discussions about the south and um and i i, I just loved writing it it was fun and it, it's fun to to do some family research on it too, um, and uh, and to be able to recover some memories from my family members that are still living. Was it kind of an eye opener, or just a whole new experience when you got to delve into what happened in your family's past? Because everybody has a tragedy, you know. It's and true. We, and when you look at the depths of how you had to find out this story, and you started uncovering information, was it like being just a, a, a sleuth? On this, or mm-hmm. was, or were you able to put your own family ties? Did you have feelings towards writing this? Oh yeah. Well, I'm definitely not objective. So to your to questions about up news objectivity, you know, they they the, the 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 former lieutenant governor, a guy named uh, Lieutenant General. Oh, sorry, yeah, Lieutenant General Henry Denhart. He uh, he claimed that she committed spontaneous suicide with his gun. Uh, it makes no sense, of course. Um, in fact, it was well known in the family, it was well known in the, in the community that she was going to break up with him that night. They were an older couple. She was 40, she was a widow, and he was uh, 60. And, um, but he was, a, he, was a, he, was a, he was quite an egotist. And he was a, he, he would fall into the, you know, perhaps some people might be reminded of the kind of bombastic things that he said and the positions that he would take, some people might associate with kind of like a kind of a, a Donald Trump type of personality. And he was very, but he was very popular for a while. And he used that popularity to bolster his defense that he was a, that he was a victim, that she just suddenly, she found his gun and just killed herself on the very night that she was there to break up with him um, she just decided she didn't want to live. And it doesn't make any sense. Of course, her daughter was about to get married. She had business arrangements the next day. I mean, there was none of it makes any sense. But so it was really fun to write the story and try to tell the story from the family's perspective and to lay out once and for all in what we know now from a modern forensic standpoint, both psychologically and, and the physical evidence of the crime, um, as an impossibility of the defense is that she committed suicide. You know, you, she, her, the bullet that killed my grandmother's first cousin was, uh, went right through her heart. But um, when the body was found, she was holding something in her left hand, and she would have then had to have fired a gun using her right hand through the left side of her body um, to somehow reach almost like, you know, Inspector Gadget or something and have this incredible arm reach to put the gun and shoot herself through her left side using her right arm. And the jury at the time went, well, gosh, that doesn't happen every day, but okay. (laughs) So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, that I got to explore in the book, and it was fun. It sounds like you had an absolute blast. Do you mind if we get to some more questions from the audience here? Oh, sure. Sorry about that, too. Yeah, no, no, oh, no, no problem. No problem at all. I, I wanted to talk about your book, so we had that opportunity. It's perfect. Zop is asking in the Revolution Radio chat room, have you ever, or did you ever, get the opportunity to interview George Carlin? Uh, yeah, I interviewed him a couple of times. Not on Coast to Coast, though. Um, on uh, local uh, radio shows, yeah, he's he was crabby, <laughs> and he wasn't always in the mood to be funny, which is always weird when you're trying to sell a comedian. And he's very smart, so like it it, it made me always be on my toes if I was going to interview George Carlin. He, he he suffered fools, fortunately, but not always gladly. And um, 
so uh, the two times I remember interviewing him, uh, the first time I just thought he was going to come on and just be really funny and just be George Carlin, and he wasn't. And then the second time I was better prepared for that, and I think it was it was a better conversation because we got into a little bit more substantive type things. Eric is asking. I did, oh, I, go ahead. I, I, I was saying something. I did write a paper about him. Um, uh, I'll just tell you that I just wrote a paper, and I went. I it was in Japan early the, earlier this year. I was presenting a paper at an international conference on communications in Fukuoka, Japan, which is a, a city name you have to be very careful when you pronounce in the United States. In yes. Fukuoka, and uh, it was great. I had a, a tremendous time, but the paper was about the the famous FCC decision or the famous Supreme Court decision in favor of the FCC against George Carlin and Pacifica Foundation um, and uh, and how it changed broadcasting in the United States um, negatively by by having them rule against that, the seven dirty words. Um, and I wrote that paper in defense of free speech. It went pretty well. Anyway, sorry. Follow up from Zob. Is there any way that anybody can acquire those interviews to listen to them? No, I don't think so. I don't have a copy of them. They, you know, they weren't that great. They were, you know, these were typical phoners. He'd be coming through town to make an appearance. You'd get him for five or ten minutes. Yeah, you know, it wasn't anything to write home about. I don't think I did that well either. So, I think if I knew what they where they existed, I would bury them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we all have those. I remember the first time I interviewed Wayne Gretzky. And, oh, and, and you know, I was uh, growing up in a hockey fa- family, and, sure. you know, Gretzky was my favorite player from the time I was seven years old when I first saw him play on TV on Hockey Night in Canada. You know, just a legend. So I'm in this scrum uh, during a Team Canada golf tournament in Vancouver as they're getting the guys together for the 2006 Olympics in Turin, Italy, which we blew because we were defending gold medal from 2002. And I got my microphone in there. I got the the area where I want to be right at his right shoulder. And I say, Wayne, do you mind if I ask you a question? And he goes, sure. And nothing came up. (laughs) <laughs> I went totally blank, totally <laughs> blank, and I'm sitting there. Um, uh, 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 oh, this isn't good. And thankfully, one of my report friends, who was a reporter, you know, he he stood up. He, he got a question in there, and I was able to regain my memory there because you know That's when right. you have the when you have the great one looking at you, and you're like you know three inches away from him, it's a little intimidating. When you're around a legend. <laughs> That's yeah. great. I got a question from Eric in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker. He is asking, Ian, did you ever find the answers you were looking for on the smiley face killer? No, but this is a really, so this was an ongoing pursuit. And it's interesting because I just saw somebody just sent something on my Facebook page about another death of another male uh, college student, same, fits in this demographic profile. And there, I, you know, the, the the concept is that there were people that were claiming that there were um, there was there was symbolism, or there was some sort of iconography, usually related to the smiley face, um, that was found near where these young men were found, where their bodies either went into the water or where their bodies came out after drowning, and. Statistically, you know, the smiley faces are everywhere. So that that's part of the problem. Is it wasn't such a unique um, uh, kind of uh, 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 graffiti to, to see around along a riverbank, for example, or you know, underneath a concrete bridge or something. So that part was tricky. And then it really it came down to somebody statistically did the story, and it's significant that there was the number of kids, boys young college men, you know, that were in this age group that died, it is statistically significant that it happened along the corridor of I-94. Um, but beyond that, nobody was ever able to get to any case where they could prove that any one person was doing that and then spray painting smiley faces on it. But it still keeps happening, you know, and it still keeps happening along that corridor 
seemingly at a higher rate than than other places, but that's all I can tell you. And I it, it kind of died when nobody else was willing to continue the investigation. Claudia in the SOR Space Travelers chat room on Facebook is asking, what has been your muse to get you in the zone that enhances your writing? And have you ever oh. written and reread what's come through? Has it ever made you feel in yeah. awe? Okay, I tell you, so thank you for that question. I just love that question. I'm borderline ADD, so I know that about myself. Um, and if I'm going to write something, and I'm in the process of, say, of like writing my dissertation right now, um, I have to be in a very kind of weird environment where I have a lot of different media and a lot of different distractions. So I'll, I, I, I literally will have, you know, my, I'll have iTunes on, I may I have my phone with me. I'll have something queued up that I'm watching right now. I'm I'm going through about every ten minutes of the old TV CBS TV movie for Helter Skelter, um, and then I'm watching. I may could be I could be having a, a fourth or fifth other thing going on at the same time, depending on what I need, and and that's what I do. So I have to kind of create this fractured environment, which other people would find very distracting. Uh, it helps me focus. And I just kind of bounce between these other things. So that's my muse. And one of the, one of the things I need too, I need, I need, I really kind of need a, like a kiss in the forehead from my wife and stuff. I kind of need to feel like the world is at peace. I have time. I don't have to take the car in for an oil change or anything. You know, I'm the, everything's fine. And I, when if I have that, I can I can do much. But if I if I can't, I, I do very little. And um, so, yeah, and I love I love listening to new music. So I will. Uh, I don't. I don't listen. To, I listen to some classic music, some classic rock. But I, I also like, you know, the things that kids are listening to today. I find that also very interesting, very we tr- inspiring. We try and tie everything into Guns and Roses here, one way or another. It's just the way so, we do. And I like GNR. So you know, I'll give you an example. Like one of the things I was doing when I was writing earlier this summer, the thing I was watching just since you mentioned Guns N' Roses, was the VH1 Behind the Music episode about Guns N' Roses. Yes. So I, I watch, while I'm writing, I'm watching, the, I'll stop about every 15 minutes. I'll go to Facebook. I'll log something on Facebook. I'll watch five minutes of Behind the Music with Guns N' Roses, and then I'll go back to writing again. So I'm, just, I'm just glad they're back together, sort of. Sort of. Yeah. Yes. I have a question from Michael in the SOR Space Travelers. He is asking about at the interview you did with yourself as Jesus. Okay, no, I wasn't Jesus, but I did do the interview with the guy who has the syndicated show where he is Jesus. So he was Jesus, because that's what he goes by when he does the show. I loved that show. That was hugely controversial giant pushback on that show i loved it but it believe me i i heard about that for years people are furious about somebody claiming to be jesus i just think he channels this sort of beautiful sort of prophetic voice and i like what he does with it but but i like him <laughs> so Joe has an interesting question here, and this goes to, you know, why stories or the public feels stories gets get pushed under the rug. He is asking, why isn't the media, in your opinion, Ian, reporting any more on the disaster at Fukushima? Is the story not sexy enough, or did the government shut everyone down? Well, you know, we just want new. Everybody wants new. You know, the the funny is the. The people in Japan, they want new more than anybody. Um, they, they, they move off of things so fast in Japan. I just found it fascinating when I was there. Um, so it, what he's asking is a really good question, but it, what he, he's also asking for is sort of boutique journalism. Journalism technically really should just be about the things that are happening today. A short, you know, some updates on things that have happened – and and maybe a little bit sort of playing into the future of what's coming up. But if you're looking, I mean, I, I, I wish there was more, I wish there were, say, more magazine pieces about Fukushima or that 
uh, science digests were doing books, you know, or, or long form articles about um, these types of uh, disasters and the implications for the planet, et cetera. I don't think anybody's stopping it. Now, that doesn't mean that private industry is going to be all that cooperative. And there may be that government, in the Japanese government, might feel like they'd rather not people talk about Fukushima anymore because they want to promote tourism because people are starving, you know, or the businesses are going out of business because they can't attract people to that area. So is, could there be other interests? Sure. But I think part of it just comes down to is you, you have to know your audience. And if there were more people clamoring for those stories, there'd be more people writing them. And this is an interesting development in journalism, this idea of the sort of privately funded journalist, um, this is happening more and more. You know, people are graduating from journalism programs, and they, there's just fewer jobs. And so there are a lot of people who are, tour, you know, kind of doing this crowdfunded journalism thing, where they're just going to find one person, and they're going to pay one year enough for them to live on, and they want that person to go out and report the stories and find, you know, dig and do the investigative pieces on stories that they want other people to read. This is becoming a very interesting trend in journalism. I, I highly recommend it. Bruce wants to know, in the SOR Space Travelers, how is your tinnitus these days? Is it still bugging you? Yeah, yeah. It's crap. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> move on. We'll move Next on question. with that. <laughs> William is asking, what really happened to unbiased reporting in the news? It seems two channels report on the same topic, but you get two different versions of the event. Good. Good. If they did one version, then that would require collusion. So we don't want that. So we want two different versions. We want ten different versions. Does it mean it's unbiased? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I think this term has gotten overused, and I think it, it may have never been precise enough in the first place. And so somewhere between the imprecision of its original concept and now its overuse, it's lost all meaning. Uh, I, I, I will talk, uh, I'll, I'll address something here. I, maybe this is an interesting thing, maybe it's not. But I, I think if you want to blame anybody for this, blame Edward R. Murrow. When people talk about Edward R. Murrow like he was this, you know, he was the paragon of journalism. He was, the, 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 he, everything he did was what journalists should do today. And actually, what everything Edward R. Murrow did is what journalists are doing today. And, and, and I'll explain that by saying Edward R. Murrow was not really a journalist. He was an orator. He studied, he never studied journalism. Uh, I think he went to the University of Washington. He had a great voice. Um, and he, he could tell a story beautifully. He studied oration. He, when it, his, you know, his stories, this is London, and you would hear the sound of the, you know, the sirens going off in the background. He was not working as a journalist. He, 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 he famously said that he would, you know, you, you, you never give equal time to the devil. He wasn't. He wasn't going to give equal time to Adolf Hitler in World War II. He was going to tell the story of America winning the war. That was what he was doing. And that's what people needed him to do. And so if you listen to his reports, they're incredibly biased, right? But what's wrong with that? He's standing in the middle of this rubble, and he's telling the story of how people were killed that night. You don't tell the quote-unquote other side of the German side of the story, what's the point? So he told these very you know, structured stories that, by the way, had to pass government censorship in World War II. And they're amazing, and they're great. But if you go back even to that famous showdown, you know, the good night, good luck myth of Edward R. Murrow versus Joseph McCarthy, it didn't happen. You know, people talk about, you know, why don't we have more journalists like Edward R. Murrow? Go online, go to YouTube, and watch the famous, what's often referred to as the takedown of jo Joseph McCarthy. It, it was not an interview with Joseph McCarthy. Edward R. Murrow did what John Stewart does, does in The Daily Show, or did. 
he, he, he pulled clips, and he essentially interviewed the clips of Joseph McCarthy and mocked him while he was doing it. So, you know, people talk about it like that was something back then, it was, but it wasn't. It was a very biased report about Joseph McCarthy. The only saving grace was, they said at the very end, we invite the senator to come on and to respond to this. We will give him equal time. And they did. And two weeks later, McCarthy went on and made an ass of himself. But it wasn't, it's not uh, impartial. And, and, and that was something which I think people often sort of, I mean, they mythologize it. But beyond that, they also kind of romanticize it. And they, they picture him as being this thing that he wasn't. And, and in fact, when he went to work for the Kennedy administration, um, and he was, that was his job, was essentially as a propagandist for the Kennedy administration. That's, well, that was the last job he was doing before he died, and he was very comfortable in that role. He was very pro-American, which is lovely. But he wasn't there. He wasn't naming names. You know, he wasn't blowing the lid off any stories in Washington. He was in cahoots with all those folks. Well, so let's, get, about. let's get to a few more questions because we only have about ten minutes left with you, and I know there's a ton of questions here from our audience because probably you know they haven't heard from you in a while. Cla- right. Claudia is asking, Ian, were you into the paranormal before hosting Coast to Coast? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, loved it, and and you know I I just I every book I could read every every subject I could explore. No, I loved it, and still do. Still, I mean, there's I I I too want to know some of these things, and I I I can't uh, I can't tell you how grateful I am when people put things on my Facebook page from you know some discovery of some cave somewhere, and at the bottom of that cave are these skulls and whatever, and oh, I'm so in. Yeah, no. I loved it. Now, there's certain topics I, I just didn't accept um, when I did Coast to Coast. I, I really, like, I would look into chemtrails. I did. I thought, wow, that's such a fascinating idea. Um, and I found absolutely nothing to it except people just quoting other people, quoting other people, quoting other people, none of whom had any primary information. Everybody was just saying, you can't tell me the government's not doing this. And I would talk to pilots, and I talked to physicists, and everybody was like, that's impossible to spray something that high up in the air. It's just, it's all, they were contrails from planes, but they weren't chemtrails. So I, there weren't every, there wasn't everything that was quote-unquote paranormal that I was into. Some of it just was just too out there for me. What topic wouldn't you get into? Well, that was one of them. The other thing, I, I tried to, you know, I, I, I embraced a lot of topics that the other hosts wouldn't do. So I was just, you know, I'm amongst one. I happen to be one of the longest-running hosts on Coast to Coast, and I was proud of that. Um, but I, I, I liked doing things like, I liked exploring things like Satanism and other things which other people didn't enjoy. I think if there was one thing, surprisingly, then, that you didn't hear me do a lot of, is I didn't do a lot of conversations about angels and um i mean a couple of times but after a while again there was sort of nothing new there for me um and so when people talk about you know that everybody's got a guardian angel and that guardian angel is watching over you every day that that gets hollow for me and i think i had a real problem with it when i knew somebody whose child was hit by a car and and their response was where was my child's guardian angel why didn't why didn't my child rate? And I, I had no answer for that, and it just, it just bugged, and I, I just didn't I didn't stay comfortable in that topic, so I, I didn't go back there very often. Bill Cardwell has a question in this SOR Space Travelers on Facebook. What news story from the last decade do you think has captivated us all worldwide more than any other? Hmm. What major like real news? Well, obviously nine yeah. eleven. You know, and I think the 9-11, we're still unpacking 9-11. Psychologically, it's affected a generation that's, people don't, I mean, I've, I, I have students who have grown up essentially all post-9-11. They were, you know, they were five, six, whatever when 9-11 happened, but now they're, they're, 
their their college age, and they their life is forever impacted by a post nine eleven world, um, and it changes the sort of the it, the quality or the qualities of that generation. They tend to be much more fragile, um, a little more easily scared. I think. Um, so yeah, I think the impact of nine eleven is still something we're sorting out. Do you buy the whole conspiracy theory notion of 9-11 or Sandy Hook or the Boston Which bombing? One? Any other? Which one? Do you well, buy that's it? my point. Yeah. Which one? You know, I mean, the, the, this idea that somehow somebody has the truth, I, I can't... The, no. The short answer is I, 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 I don't see any proof. I see rude speculation that doesn't stand up to scrutiny or peer review. And and that's one of the things, maybe if I've gotten a little snobby since I went back for another degree, it's I really want to see stuff get the scrutiny and peer review that it deserves. If you really want to make a claim that parents are faking the deaths in Sandy Hook, prove that. <laughs> you know, this idea of taking a picture from the Internet and giving it a new caption and or, you know, Phrasing everything in, forms, in terms of a question, false equivalencies. I've, I've become completely allergic to false equivalencies. Um, I, even just rhetorically, I just I can't even have conversations where people are making these crazy sort of binary kind of. You must then what you're saying is you know that kind of guy at the end of the bar yes. kind, of, kind of conversation. I, I hate that. So that's what I see mostly when I see the Sandy Hook stuff. Um, I know people who are in Washington, I mean, I know them personally, who saw the plane hit the Pentagon. What do I tell them? No, you didn't. You're part of the conspiracy. No, I I don't. What about the sensationalism that a lot of journalists are having? In particular... Stop! Stop! What's wrong with sensationalism? Well, when you have Alex Jones, and I'll give you an example here because I'm prepared for this. Yes. When you have yes. Alex Jones coming on social media, breaking news, InfoWars has learned who is winning the Super Bowl this coming weekend. And then he comes on, so he gets everybody all hyped up, sensationalizes the headline, and then comes on and says, it's the advertisers and the owners. Like, okay. It's not the game. Okay, so that's not... So I would argue here, and this is, let me say this. Sure. I happen to be a fan of sensationalism, but let me explain to you what that means. The original idea of sensationalism, the term was invented, actually, by mainstream journalists, essentially, to, um, to look down... to have a way of describing uh, re- reportage that excited the senses... So that's the original claim of sensationalism, because journalism was supposed to be all about the mind. It was supposed to be about gathering facts, and facts did not create sensations. We were supposed to be, we were supposed to approach this, um, you know, a news story uh, in in this sort of highly objective view from 30,000 feet, and anybody that got you worked up after reading the story, where you were emotionally having a reaction, that was sensationalizing the story. You were having sensations. So I happen to believe that really, that's why I, I like true crime, is it is sensational. You have a reaction. We have an emotional engagement to a story. Like the one I, the, one, the book, I, a Black Knight for a Bluegrass Bell. I want people to be mad. I want people to read it and go, ah. I, I want them to have that reaction. How can that be? You know, not that. You know, that's that's what I want. I don't want them just to sit there and read a bunch of sort of laundry list of facts. So that that to me is sensationalism. The thing that well, you mentioned about Alex Jones, and I'll just take your word for it on something like that. There's certainly journalism does that, like that that idea of um, the the uh, the the BSTs, which we get. I see that. You know, all the time, you know, they'll show a story, a plane going to the ground, and then they'll freeze frame it in the tease. And we'll, we'll tell you what happens tonight at 11. Well, no, that's just, that's just, that's, that's just cheap. I don't, that's not sensationalism to me. That's just, that's a ruse. 
right? That's just hucksterism. And that's what I mentioned to you before. Stay away from hucksterism. There's plenty of that out there. And and I think to say I'll, you know, who the big winner is and then and then have a like an ending like that that it's the advertiser, that's just that's that's hucksterism. We only got about two minutes with you, my friend, and I wanna take this time to say thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure. There's not many shows where I smile from start to finish, and okay. I and I have really, really enjoyed that. So I would love it if you took some time to plug your book, maybe tell us about the next book that is coming up or what's in your future. Uh, well, let me say, so uh, Black Knight for Bluegrass Bell is available. I think the publisher still had a price discount. I couldn't be sure. But if you go to the page, you pre-order it. It comes out in about five weeks, so you won't have to wait long. Um, and it, it really is the story of two murders. Uh, and I'll just leave it there. But it's 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 the story of Kentucky, you know, in in the U.S. Um, is a unique has a unique character, and this book explores this. Uh, murder that happened within my family, and then eventually how my family decided to right the ship, how they decided to go about getting justice on their own. Um, and it, so it's, it is the story of the last, what they call the code of honor killing in the state of Kentucky. Um, and I'm very proud of it. So I, I hope that people will enjoy it and um, put a lot of work into it and cool photos. Uh, which awesome. should come with every true crime book. Got to cut you off, my friend. It's time. Thank yep. you so much for being on Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thanks it's been a real me. pleasure. Take care. No, nope. appreciate it. Take care. Bye bye. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. We'll give you some equipment updates and some of our experiences on the road. Right here on Spaced Out Radio. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with you 4 Cop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Witkowski's Strange Days. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. Have you checked out the SOR Spacewire at spacedoutradio.com yet? Every day we post the latest stories regarding the weird, strange, and completely unbelievable. From cryptid and UFO sightings to the conspiracy world, we tackle it all. Hi there, I'm Eric Markham, Space Out Radio's news director for the SOR Space Fire. And if you have a story, I want to hear it. Email me at news at spaceoutradio.com. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. 
Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Every month on Spaced Out Radio, we look into the deep and dark reports of cryptids roaming around the world with me, Rob Morphy, from Cryptopia.us. I would love it if you would join me and host Dave Scott as we delve into the most arcane stories and reports regarding creatures of the unknown. My job is to hunt down the details and bring the evidence forward to you. These aren't your regular Bigfoot stories I'm talking about either. You can find out more about crypto history at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. Spacedoutradio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you'd join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Find yourself constantly looking up in the sky, looking for answers? Have you had extraterrestrial contact? Are you an abductee? Looking for answers to your experiences? Hi there, I'm R. Keith Andrews, Spaced Out Radio's resident ET expert. Join me live the first Friday of every month where I take questions from the Spaced Out Radio chat room and help you understand those from the far off world. It's two hours of knowledge every experiencer should listen to. Hope to see you there. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with us on Spaced Out Radio? Head to spacedoutradio.com to check out the latest shows, guests, and sponsors. And don't forget to sign up for the Space Travelers Club. You'll find all you need at spacedoutradio.com. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us as we broadcast live here on Thursday night, early Friday morning. Tomorrow night on the show, we round out the week before giving away to Spaced Out Weekend. Lori McDonald will be our guest. We're going to talk hypnotherapy and how she helps people who have been abducted by extraterrestrials. That is tomorrow night on the Mighty SOR, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time at spaceoutradio.com. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter 
at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott S O R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. While there, you can join the S O R Space Travelers. It's only five bucks a month. With that, you get access to a private group interviews. You get access to a private section for your postings on the website, and your name gets entered into monthly prize draws. We give back to you, our valued listener. You can also check out the SOR Space Wire with Eric Markham, our news director. You can check out who does our music. Well, former Guns N' Roses lead guitarist Ron Bumblefoot Thal takes care of all of Spaced Out Radio's music. And you can read our latest blogs. Mine is on how to make an emotional commitment with the audience. We change up the blogs once a week. Tonight's password from Bill Cardwell in the SOR Space Travelers is Scrivener. Scrivener is your password for tonight. Use it wisely, Space Travelers. We don't want you to get in any trouble without using it because it can be dangerous at times. That's just the way it is. Remember, if you are listening in on Revolution Radio, Revolution Radio is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Take the time to donate today. We bring in Eric Squared for the final hour of Spaced Out Radio after Ian Punnett, former host of Coast to Coast AM on the weekends, was our guest for the first two hours. Remember, you can get Ian's book at acclaimpress.com, A Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell. It's a true crime story that he has written. And we bring in Eric Squared, Eric Markham from the SOR Space Wire, and Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal, and both guys now having a new show called S4 with Eric Squared that we're going to be promoting here on Spaced Out Radio. Gentlemen, welcome back. Hey, glad to be here. Hey. I absolutely have to tell you, I had so much fun talking to Ian. And I really meant it. You know, there's a lot of times we do these interviews on a nightly basis, and sometimes you have to bite your cheek. Sometimes you have to just say, you know, the best part about this show was it ended. Because not everyone can be, not everyone can be a gem, right? And they happen. You try and vet it as much as possible. But when you get a classy guy like Ian, and believe me, this was the first time I've ever talked to him. And what a pleasure that was to have him on the show. Now, Coop, I know you got some technical problems at home with your internet, so you didn't uh, catch the full show. No, so I missed it. I know, but your beard is very, very nice. So I'm going to bring I'm going to bring in Eric Markham on this. Right. How, how nice was it, Eric Markham, to hear Ian's voice back on the radio? It was great. I mean, <clears throat> I kept my subscription to the other show for a long time after I had gotten disgusted with the main host because I enjoyed his interview style. Uh, if he got somebody that was doing the plug a minute on their book, well, buy the book, buy the book, he would nail them so so quick. It's like, well, that you know, that's enough of the plugs. Let's talk, you know. And he wouldn't be mealy mouth about or anything, but yeah. And, and sometimes he'd rein them in. It's like, yeah, well, that's you know, he and George Knapp were the should have ended up with Coast to Coast, but I don't know how. That it was just he got me through a lot of night shifts. I'll say that. You know, the one thing that I liked about talking with him was how candid the interview was. Like he was very open. He was very upfront. You know, it was nice to see that he moved on from doing radio because of his tinnitus. He just couldn't do it anymore. It still you could tell it was still a sore subject for him because nobody wants to have a a medical problem that you're affected but for by the rest of your life. But to hear how candid that he had grown at peace that he just wasn't going to do radio anymore, it was nice to hear, wasn't it? Yes. And you know, get I I have a lot of respect for anybody that keeps going for their education, keeps doing, keeps expanding their minds. It's uh, usually somebody has achieved like he did. They stop and rest on their laurels. And it was nice to know that he was evolving and keeping himself active intellectually. I would love to take his classes 
on journalism and on what he teaches. And that, thanks for asking that question about how to vet sources, because I run into a lot of that. What he was talking about, so and so said, and then you look up so and so, and all they're doing is quoting somebody else. You never find a prime source on this stuff. <laughs> so it was good to hear that I'm not alone in, that, in my search there. <laughs> Well, you know what? I was a big fan, and, you know, like I said at the first part of the show, I mean, when you're at a competing radio station uh, compared to one that is syndicating coast-to-coast at that time, you know, when we're sitting there listening to Ian on the weekends because he was just, he brought a a different flavor of journalism to the weekends, I thought it was incredible, and, you know, I always wondered what happened to him because I just, honestly, I never knew, you know, and, you know, there are certain topics you just don't think about, you know, hopping on, whatever, unless it's like 10 to 15 years later, but now we know, and the fact that he's now found up for writing and writing novels and then going back to get his doctorate in journalism, I think, you know, he's found his path, he's found his niche, and it's worth it. You know, I would definitely bring him back on again. I could tell you that. Oh, that would be, yeah. He's, well, I like the way where if you start getting on a subject that he's got a strong opinion of, and he jumps right in there, I, that has to be kind of hard to, to interview somebody that gets a, you know, gets a jump on a subject like that. But then again, he's not doing the brad steiger where he you know he talks around what he wants to say he was just like really direct like you said the can how candid he was was very refreshing he wasn't afraid to say whatever it was he wanted to say absolutely so we talked a lot about journalism tonight and whether or not the wool is being pulled over the listeners or the viewers eyes and ian was adamant that it isn't and i have stated on this show not to try and take his side because i'm like oh ian punnett was on the show that's not what this (laughs) is about because i have stated this on the show i'm not a believer at least up here in canada i don't know what's happening in the u.s that the media isn't pulling the wool over people's eyes because being in a newsroom i know how it works been there, seen how the newsroom works. But Ian's point was this, and it was a question that Joe Algeyer had in regards to Fukushima, was the reason why a lot of these stories are so-called swept under the rug is because the audience wants advancement. They want new. They don't want to dwell on what's happened in the past. They want to keep moving forward. Do you buy that, Eric Markham? I just think we have such a short attention span. I mean, look at everything's been reduced to sound bites, jingoism. If you can't consume it in 15 seconds, I think he was giving a little more credit than was due. I believe that we are being manipulated in that what we're being fed in those snippets, the you know, the mass media, I, I think there is a programming going on. So I, I'm not quite, I, I couldn't really agree with him there. I'd have to agree to disagree with Ian on that one. I do think there's some manipulation going on. There's a reason that kids are graduating out of colleges without fundamental education foundations. I know of at least one bachelor of science graduate who can't spell or uses the wrong case since, you know, uses the wrong synonym and just, it, or homophone, I'm sorry, the, like no and no N-O and no K-N-O-W. They use it in the wrong sense. It's oh, spelled yes. correctly because the auto, you know, the spell corrector got it, but it's not the right word for the sentence and they got through college this way with a degree i mean i used to do these three pay we had clinical chemistry and the tests were a nightmare we all met in a bar across the street from the college afterwards 
you know, to have a beer and relax because they were taxing. You could go through three, literally, I'm not exaggerating, three to four pages of calculations for your answer. Screw up at the end, and maybe it was supposed to be milligrams for, you know, you get the units wrong, you missed the whole thing. You could have the right numbers, but if you got the units wrong, that was, you know, that was it. Now, I guess as long as you get a number or you get an answer at the end of the equation, it, it's good. I'm working with new techs that have no idea beyond, okay, the computer doesn't say it's a critical value, let it go. They can't look at a chemistry and see what's wrong. You know, this doesn't look right. There's something that's been, you know, contaminated. They just stamp and go. We're being dumbed down by what we're being fed in the mass media. My opinion. (laughs) Coop, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? In regards to what Eric said. The, that oh, the what do I think of? Yeah. What do I think of that? Um, I would have to agree with them. Um, and and d- dumb down is a, a good word uh, or a, a good phrase. But uh, on the same token, you, you see, you you can see a huge contrast between media sources. I mean, there's a big difference between CNN and Fox, for example. Yes, polar opposites. Right, and they're both they, they spoon feed you. If that makes sense, I mean, yeah, you, they're they're yeah. pushing their agenda. They're pushing their side. They're, you know, they're presenting right. the information in such a way that yes, I'm right, I'm right, or you know, they're yeah, wrong. His, they're wrong. His CNN was completely Hillary, Fox, and and. Uh, I can't remember what MSNBC was, but Fox is completely Trump. And they're a big reason, and I think the, and that's why I think the government's behind it, because they're a big reason for the division. The division of this country. Well, I've noticed in a lot of cases, people won't talk politics, or they'll start, and it doesn't become an intellectual conversation. It <laughs> generates into a ad hominem attack. It becomes a, we've gotten so separated, so polar. Mm-hmm. You know, that was one of the things Tip O'Neill, you couldn't have got two more di- different politicians than Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. Mm-hmm. But they genuinely, they liked each other on a personal level. And so, you know, the way politics used, I think it was Daniel Patrick Moynihan said the way politics used to work, your arrival on the other side of the aisle and you would be shouting, you know, doing your demagoguery. But at the end of the day, they went to the bar, they had a few drinks, you went to, you know, they went to the lounge and relax and it's like, okay, what is it you really want? And they would mm-hmm. do these compromises face to face and the job would get done. We're at that point now where one side is either totally in control or the other side is totally in control. There's very little compromise. What they call compromise lately has just been letting the other side have their way. It wasn't compromise. It was knuckling under, but it was repackaged as compromise. We've lost the ability in politics to get to a common ground and work on that common ground. Common ground's gotten stomped into mud because there's just nobody's willing to get their ideal, you know, their ideologues are not willing to bend. You yeah, can't it's have be, it all your own way. All it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see what happens after November because you can't go by anything the media is telling you anyway. You don't know who's in, in, in the running. You don't know. And, and, and who, who cares? But, yeah, you, you can't go by media to, to hear accurate news. No. and, it, and That's an important statement that you just said. Sorry to cut you off, Markham. No, but I got you. The, the preacher, sorry. 
<laughs> but but, but what, what, what Coop just said there is very important. If you can't go to the mainstream for the news, who can you go to? Because there's all sorts of people on the alternative side that are blowing such sunshine up people's butts here. <laughs> okay, and making them sound okay, making them sound very, very, you know, truthful in the stories that they are, they are reporting. Because realistically, what Alex Jones does, and we touched on that with Ian right near right before he left. Okay, is he's almost professing propaganda on his on his show. I read one the other day on on Facebook where a person put on, you know, Canada is no longer arresting people for marijuana as they've legalized it across the country. And I I spouted back on that. I said, "Actually, that is quite wrong. In fact, 300 people in Toronto just got busted out of medical marijuana depots because it's still against the law here." So there's all sorts of misinformation out there that is spreading around in what we call the alternative news. And if you can't trust the mainstream, and you can't trust the alternative because they're just making up crap as far as they want to go, who do you trust? Uh, yeah, tough. you know, I haven't, I haven't watched news in three months. Literally, three months. I, got, I found myself getting just so irritated and pissed off that it's not worth it i get i i think if you want the truth and this is going to sound off but social media you got you hear about something in new york i got friends in new york on social media so look out your window is it happening uh, i mean you know using that for example I mean, you're not going to get politics accurately still on social media because they're still watching the same news. Right. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know what. And it, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about after the show the other night with when the media got involved with the war, and that's where everything got turned around with the war because the media was there to make it all make it all a joke. Well, it, yeah, we, we've talked about this before. Before the media mm -hmm. was embedded with our troops, our troops right. were free to get the job done. And the media was behind them. You look at how the, the, the newspapers and the media behaved during World War II. And it was support the troops. It was, you know, Eisenhower is the greatest thing since... Christ walked in Galilee, you know, that was, you know, they were well, behind back, it. And, and they back didn't then they supported the, the country. Side. Right, and they didn't, they didn't dwell on the dark side. War, I don't think, like, my, daughter, my youngest daughter's generation understands, war is not a media event, it's not a reality TV show, it's frickin' nasty business. You go mm -hmm. to kill things, kill people, and mess crap up. <laughs> it's not yep. this win their hearts and minds. No. You got them by the balls and their hearts and minds will follow. You go in, you yeah, get the and job done. When and hearts and minds didn't happen. <laughs> when hearts and minds didn't happen until after the media was embedded. Right. And that's what ruined the war. Or ruined well, got the outcome. Well, we haven't had a war that the politicians weren't hamstringing the generals since World War II. And even then, right. there was some of that going on, because if, uh, if Patton had had his way, we wouldn't have had it. the whole Cold War with Russia probably would not have happened like it did. No, you know it wouldn't have. But also, Patton didn't realize how many reserve troops Stalin still had. Mm -hmm. It, it would have been nasty but but now it's like since korea you know macarthur being told no you can't go past what 58th parallel there was that the politicians started fighting the war vietnam the politicians started fighting the war you know westmoreland came out of that looking like a complete a-hole 
and that's not really where the blame should have been lay, laid. Well, I mean, you look at the media's reaction to when United States troops first landed on the shores of Somalia. The cameras yep. were the cameras were all there waiting on the beach for the boats to arrive, and it was here comes the Americans to save the day, and CNN was our, all uh, over and, it. And our Marines had to snipe out the bullets or snipe out the lights so they can make the beach landing. Yes, I mean yes. literally. Yeah, that's that's where the that's where the reality TV thing came into play. That's where it started. Obviously, I, or, that's where it started. Obviously, I mean, I, I think it was always kind of behind the scenes. The Desert Storm was a, a little bit of a start, um, and in Somalia, it was blatant. Gotta remember coming home when uh, I, I I lived like eighty miles from where I worked at the time that desert the first desert <laughs> storm happened, and we stopped to get some groceries, and it was live that real famous opening salvo where all that anti-aircraft fire is coming up out of Baghdad and I think that it was the what the Chalk and off. yeah the F-117s <laughs> had gone through and by the time the Iraqis were actually reacting the stealth fighters were gone the stealth bombers were already by probably 500 miles away I don't know but you know you had this huge image of this city at night with all these anti-aircraft guns going off. Oh, yeah. And I'm thinking, and this is, you know, it's like, damn, it's almost like this is staged. I remember seeing it then. It's like watching a war movie that's been oh, yeah. choreographed. The, the multiple camera more, angles, absolutely. I saw it more as a fireworks show. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> honestly, it looked more like fireworks. Yeah. Oh, well, here they come. Oh, look. Boom, boom, boom. Oh. Yeah, the U.S. just, that was, yeah. They, they made it look like uh, some kind of awesome event. Never mind all the loss of life. Right. Well, you know what's funny is a few years after that, I was at an air show in my hometown of Abbotsford, British Columbia. And it has one of the largest air shows. It was just, I think, last weekend. One of the largest air shows in North America. And I remember getting an opportunity to talk to an F-117 pilot. And he was, I said, well, did you fly, were you in the first Gulf War? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, what did it look like when all those tracers were being strewn all over Baghdad after you guys went over? He goes, he goes dude, when we went vertical to get out of Dodge as quickly as possible, he goes, it was probably the most beautiful fireworks scene I've ever seen. It's just too bad they were trying to kill me. Right. He goes, thankfully they couldn't see me because it was an awesome sight to see. And you think, wow, that's real. Can't imagine. Right. I was sitting in the newsroom. Actually, I was at home, and then I ended up going into the newsroom where I was when I worked in Vancouver when 9-11 hit. And I remember seeing the most incredible piece of anchoring that I have ever seen in my life. We had this reporter named Jim Benny. And if you looked at Jim, you know, you would take him for a meek, lost soul kind of guy. But when he was behind the microphone, it was it was pure professionalism. I watched him anchor for, I believe it was eight to nine hours straight without taking a break. And he had very little script to go on. And he had two monitors, one on CNN and one on, I believe it was ABC News that, or pardon me, it was CBC News here in Canada, um, watching. And he was literally doing play-by-play in his own words of what was coming up on the networks and what was happening. It was absolutely incredible i don't know if i will ever witness something like that again but you know in the height of the situation that 9-11 was to be able to watch that type of professionalism because let's face it 
We didn't know. It doesn't matter where you were. You didn't know what was happening. We didn't know if this was the start of World War III, if other cities were going to be attacked, how many other airlines were out there, you know, flying around that might be coming to North America. It was insane and straight pandemonium. And I get, and I know you guys would agree with that. Oh, but absolutely. But to be able to see that professionalism, and. Every time I hear someone kind of slag the media that we're told what we we're supposed to say, we're told what we're supposed to report, much like you see in Good Morning Vietnam where they're editing the ticker tape, you know, and Robin Williams' character didn't like that, you know, that's not what happens in a newsroom. I hate to spoil it for you, uh, you know, my fellow tinfoilers, but that's not what happens in a newsroom. It's it's just pure stories. It's about getting the information out as quickly as possible. And I think that's the biggest mass deception out there right now when it comes to the media is that the mainstream is tainted. Like I said, I don't believe for a second it's tainted up here, down south, where you don't have, you know, like we talked with Ian about a about a national true national network like we have the cbc or britain has the bbc or along there maybe a little bit of the trouble is skewed because like eric cooper said you have fox news saying one side you have cnn saying another you have the new york station saying another thing you know there's so much confusion about what's going on that I can see where to the average person out there they don't know who to believe because they do have three different media outlets taking three different political sides or three different story sides whether it's black lives matter all lives matter or no lives matter or salt and pepper matters you know we we see all that happening so I could see where your point is with this coop Yeah, um, and, and like I said, I don't know what to say. I, I have no idea how to fix it because there is no real fix for it. Well, the problem the problem that we have in 2016 is it's too late to fix a lot of this damage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Whether it's trust in the media, whether it's health care, whether it's gun control, whether it's, you know, fixing, uh, you know, to try and find the better, you know, the more... Uh, looser slots in las vegas it's too late Mm -hmm. it's too late we're moving too fast like i said to ian we're moving too fast in my opinion do you think eric markham that it's just a matter of speed that nobody has the time to catch up anymore there's so much being thrown out there at any one time it's it's almost like they know what filters people have and they're using an audience address tactic that will hit that filter and stick. It just, yeah, I did. Nobody has time to sit there and contemplate. I mean, to when uh, the hum- 